Thank you for joining us for The Drive Back, the movie podcast where we imitate our favorite thing to do after a movie, which of course is to talk about it on the ride home. I'm Garrett, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Adrian. Hey, how's it going? And today, we're going to be talking about uh, a movie that we've seen before, so that means that we're watching a do- or doing a rewatchable. What? I mean, I guess I just explained it, oh, but what wow. is a rewatchable? <laughs> a rewatchable is where we've both seen the movie, so we will let you know if it holds up in this current day and age, and if it's worth rewatching. That is absolutely correct, and today we have one that is, let's just say... A comedy classic. We're taking a look at... We, dare I say it? A comedy classic. Dare I say. <laughs> dare, dare. Um, we're going to be checking out Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So all of this and more is coming up on the drive back. Alrighty, and we're back with a rewatchable for Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Adrian, I feel like this movie really doesn't need an introduction. I feel like if you haven't seen this movie, you've at least heard of this movie. And I feel like I definitely would say that you probably may have feel like you have seen this movie because of how much it's talked about and referenced. Yeah, I think what you said earlier is that it's a comedy classic. I think it is absolutely a staple when people reference comedy and its old state that it used to be in. This is, like, the peak of that. Absolutely. It's also just, as, we, as we'll as we kind of dive into when we get into spoilers, um, it is a master class in making a movie on a low budget. Like... Yeah, it feels <laughs> like... It, it feels like someone gave a bunch of friends slightly too much money <laughs> to make the movie. Like, it could have been, like, this equally had all the jokes that could have been done super, super low budget. But they were like here's like a hundred K or however much it was. And then they were able to make a fantastic movie. But the main oh. thing about it is that all these jokes, yes. I mean, they're dated. Definitely. I mean, comedy has changed a lot, but some of them are just still so funny that it's almost unbelievable how well they were able to pick the jokes and deliver them. It's, it's pretty incredible. I'm very interested to see what, when you think, which ones you think are dated. So okay. we'll definitely jump into those when we jump into spoilers. But uh, before we do, we should probably warn, uh, drop, I guess, a little tidbit of knowledge, as we like to do. Uh, released in 1975, Monty Python and the Holy Grail was directed by Terry Gilliam and Terry Jones and stars Graham Chapman, John Cleese, and Michael Palin. King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table embark on a surreal, low-budget search for the Holy Grail, encountering many very silly obstacles. It is worth it to note that the film is the 134th highest rated film of all time, according to IMDb. So, very yeah, key Yeah, that there. all makes sense. Uh, totally. But, uh, you know, we've kind of gone over some spoiler-free thoughts already. Um, I do want to check out and see where it's actually streaming, uh, just because I own it on several different platforms. Uh, it looks right. like it is on Netflix, so you can oh, watch well, it on Netflix. Uh, and you can rent it on, you know, Apple, Amazon, wherever you rent your movies from. Um, but, uh, back at it, we're talking, let's talk some spoilers. And I'm very keen to know what you think, da- what, what jokes you think are dated. Okay, spoiler warning. Yeah, spoilers mm-hmm. out of the way. Um, a lot lands in this movie, for sure. Uh, I think a, a specific joke, there's more like scenes that I think just didn't make me laugh as hard as I remember them making me laugh. Mm-hmm. Um, but one joke in particular that I think has not aged well with me individually is... When he's about to throw the Holy Grail, or the Holy Hand Grenade, and he counts to five. I used to, that joke used to kill me. Like, when he just miscounts. And it's like this whole big preparation for, like, the littlest explosion ever. I think comedy is so fast-paced now that it's it's more a reflection of me, and probably my, my oversaturation of speed in comedy, that makes that not pay off. Like, I feel like that whole story could... Not that it should have, could have been told in 10 seconds. But the fact that it's drawn out is funny. I just feel like it just doesn't land the way it used to when things were slower paced for me personally. Um, And then there's other things that are absolute classics. Like, uh, 
I actually found a lot of... Okay, this is actually a positive, I guess. But I found a lot of humor in the part where he goes to the castle of Anthrax. <laughs> when I was a kid, I didn't really grasp what was happening there. I just thought, like, he was trying to escape because I was so young. Yeah. Super funny scene when they're like, uh, and then you'll spank her, and then you'll have to spank me. And then, and me! And it's like, and me! Oh, and yeah. me! Um, um, but a, a couple but I saw the I... grail here. That's a grail-shaped light. <laughs> <laughs> like that, yeah. But I think, I, I guess some of the ones that didn't land for me as much were the Knights of Knee. I know that's probably, this is super hot take. I feel like that was a pretty flat moment for me now. Um, and maybe because I just, that was a joke just in silliness. Like, there was just no, there was nothing else besides, this is dumb and it's funny. Yeah, it's, uh, it's absurdist and, kind of humor. Like, it's just, yeah. You that know. one was just a little bit more where there was, like, nothing. Watching it back now, again, I've seen it so many times that it was literally just like, a, oh, I know this scene. Okay, like, cool. Yeah. Um, and then I have to get a shrubbery. Uh, and then, which is, I think that the act of what happens afterwards is way funnier than that initial, the, the initial conversation. Who knows for, what kind of world we live in when <laughs> young men walk around saying, nee, to old ladies. <laughs> Who are you? I am Tom. Tom the Shrubber. <laughs> and then the other one, the last one I really found that fell short for me was the Black Knight. Wow, that's... I, I know, but They're, just on this Pitchforks are part, being sharpened right now. I know, and that's the last one I'll say, because the rest is mostly positive, but I, like that to me was... Again, maybe just because I've seen it so many times. Maybe. That it's just it, this watch through, and this this is rewatchables, right? So this is more about is it worth rewatching? There are scenes that definitely fall flat on the rewatch. There, if it's your first time watching it, they're gonna kill you. It's a great movie. It's one of the, the 134th highest rated of all time, or whatever. Yeah. Like they're still great. This is rewatchables, and on the rewatch, some of it doesn't land, at least for me. Gotcha. I mean, when I when I think of rewatchables, I think it's just a vehicle for us to review movies that we've already seen. So like, I guess I, I guess I, I it's kind of weird. Maybe I don't go into it watching. Is it rewatchable? I'm kind of like, oh, I get to rewatch it so oh, I can finally much. score it. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, maybe we're two different interpretations of the title. <laughs> but <laughs> okay. we got we, we do got to give a shout out real quick because uh, I feel like everyone we've shown we like you show this movie to at least will laugh most of the time. I would say. That's funny. Quick shout out to Zach, the only person I know who has fallen asleep during this movie. Just, I, Zach you, Andridge, huh? Yeah. Was it late was it after class or a work shift? Maybe it was, but I know we showed it to him. It was you and I were there. It was this was in college, and we showed I'm it fair. to him. Yeah, I could have sworn you were there, or maybe maybe it was no, it was you. It was definitely you, because we were talking it up. All right. Maybe, maybe it was. Well, you heard it here first. Zach, I was there. Too. Zach, I expect a phone call <laughs> after this releases. <laughs> but, he is a dedicated uh, listener. Thanks for listening always, Zach. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Thank you, everyone, for de listening dedicatedly, if you are. Uh, we actually, I just got a notification today, by the way, quick off topic. We hit 1,500 downloads uh, across Spotify hey. and all that. So 1,500 people, or well, there's 1,500 downloads of our episodes, so... We haven't even hit 100 episodes yet, so that means each one's... We got 10 listeners, folks. <laughs> That's what that means. We have 10 active, dedicated listeners. Um, and that's what I would like to thank everyone. I feel like when you make it to the top of the peak, a lot of people like to see you fail. But we've made it here, and we are just absolutely thriving with our 10 followers. <laughs> um, thank you, each and every one of you. Another big one that I do have to shout out if we are shouting out Zach... Uh, is Cassidy's father, Steve Eddy. He is a listener of every single episode and a talker of every single episode. Like, I know for a fact that he has listened <laughs> every episode. Sometimes he asks me about things, and I'm like, we talked about that? And he goes, yeah. I'm just, <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. Always much appreciated. Yeah, and I remember he called me out for my opinions on Goodwill Hunting, so that was fun. Sorry. Hey, <laughs> yeah, at least he listens. Uh, uh, but back to it. I, I, honestly, I think it's kind of a, it's a weird for me to talk about this movie because it's been such a large part of my life for so long. It's one of those movies like I had watched it so much as a kid, mm -hmm. and like to the point like when I was I was in uh, when I was in Boy Scouts, we were doing a, a hike at this local trail, and it was a long hike. We actually 
recited pretty much the entire movie by memory. Like, me and a couple other scouts as we were going. Like, just to help pass the time. It was, it was super fun for your troop leader that didn't like the movie. <laughs> <laughs> He's just seething in the background. Like, <laughs> um, but, like, that's like that's where I'm coming from, this movie. Like, I, I own it. I've had it on several different platforms. Or not, like, not platforms. Like, what's the word I'm Formats. looking for? Formats. There we go. Um, and it's just it's just one of my favorite movies of all time. Like, honestly, we talked about this, I think, when we did our top ten genre films, like, maybe two years ago at this point. Um, but, like, it was really between this and Blazing Saddles for my favorite comedy of all time. And if that's indicative of the score I'm going to give it, I think, you know, a lot of people can deduce pretty easily what I'm going to give this movie. Um, but I do yeah. want to talk about some of the, the positives of, of the jokes that I think absolutely still land and hit really hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them is the Trojan Bunny. <laughs> yep. When and it's not just the Trojan Bunny that I mean it's obviously all funny, but when they're sitting outside and he goes, so what's next? In the middle of the night, we jump out and he goes, who jumps out? We do. And he just looks at him like, what? and they all their, and they all just put their hands down. And he's like, well, if we built this large wooden badger. Yeah. <laughs> so that's still super funny. And then all just in general, a bunch of the little gags like when the the prince shoots the, the message out the window with the arrow, and it hits his buddy. Message for you, like, sir! He's like, you've been mortally wounded. He goes, actually, I, I think I might join you. I like, walk it off, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, you must stay. And, um, so, like, all those little bits are funny, but one of the most classic, by far, to me, was is the scene where they have to cross the bridge and answer this question. question. And, yeah. I mean, just a master class in writing a sketch, right? That's what this movie is. It's a bunch of skits. Yeah. stitched together to form one big narrative. Um, and that is just so funny when he goes, how do you know so much about Harry? And he goes, oh, you have to know a lot of things as a king. But the way it like flips back in the, the writing of blue, no, yellow! As he ah! gets the <laughs> uh, That's great. And then my other favorite bit too is the modern day police chasing them. Yeah. Throughout the whole thing, like this clearly takes place or it's supposed to take place in like ancient medieval times. <laughs> and, and there's like literally modern day London cab police detectives yeah. like chasing which, them through the world. Which leads me into my favorite moment, which is still the end. Like, you know, it's, I think, I don't remember if this, this story is 100% accurate, but they only had all those extras for like a super short amount of time. And like, you know, you, like for maybe for cost reasons, they couldn't film like a battle or anything. So it was literally just like, oh yeah, the police are going to show up and they're going to take King Arthur into custody. And then the movie just ends. And it's yeah. like... And it just is, it's black with music playing for like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I do want to I do want to say like the the streaming versions of this movie, you really lose uh, a, a a really funny bit in my opinion. So when you watch this on Netflix, I think and if you rent it, you start the movie and it just it just starts like it goes through the credits. The subtitle sequence at the beginning. Yes, with with a moose biting first the guy's sister, uh, and then the <laughs> seizure inducing llama <laughs> credits, <laughs> but which we haven't even talked about that yet. Um, but in the DVD, the original DVD release, I bought the anniversary fork uh, Blu-ray. I want to see if it's on there too. You start the movie and it's a completely different film. It's like one of those short films about like a toothpaste shop in London. Oh and, wow! And it's like a big band jazz like intro, and it's like, you know, like showing all these toothpaste products, and then it's like a woman walking up to the store and she opens it up, and then like you start hearing like the real mess up, and the guy in the booth's like, "I got the wrong bloody film," and it's just like, "Please excuse this this technical difficulty or whatever," and then it shifts to the movie, and it's always oh. been an incredible part of the viewing experience and it's just lost every time now because it's not on Netflix. It's not That's on anything totally else. worth owning it, especially if you're going to show someone for the first, for that first watch. They're like, yeah, That's are we watching me. King Art? Like what? <laughs> and you're just like, here you go. Um, absolutely fantastic. It's just, it's, I, love, uh, I also loved a little bit cause I'm a big fan of tiny little, like the subtle things in movies. And I love that the intermission happens in the last 15 minutes. Like, intermissions have historically been in the middle of the film to give people a break. Yeah. This one, it goes to intermission, and then there's literally, like, four minutes left of the movie. <laughs> you could have just stuck out the rest of the movie 
<laughs> it's not but even they that long. long. <laughs> they literally throw in an intermission. And it's like, okay, go. And Wait, then come back. <laughs> is that like, is that supposed to be like maybe a joke at movies like Lawrence of Arabia or something that have actual intermissions because they're so long? And maybe that's another joke they're playing on the audience where it's like, oh, oh yeah, you're going to be here for four more hours. Let's go. Well, that, that's absolutely what I think they're doing is like yeah. towards the end, you've already watched whatever, like an hour and something. And then it's like, wait, we're only halfway through? And then it totally builds up. You think a gigantic fight is about to happen. And then <laughs> the movie just ends. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what? Like, And you're talking about the little things, too. Like, every sequence, every time I go back and watch the movie, I feel like I, I, I notice something new. Yeah. And, I mean, not that this is any new by any stretch, but what I'm talking about is, like, the very beginning sequence, you know, bring out your dead, and he's wheeling the cart around. There's just a woman in the back beating a cat against her house. For no reason. Yeah, <laughs> it's just rare, rare, And you're just like, what the heck is going on? And that's not even the focus of the sequence. It's just those little background things yeah. are just so much fun to watch. So the little thing, like, when they're doing the cartoon... Obviously, that jumps to cartoon a lot. If you've seen the movie, you know that. It's how they kind of didn't do CGI. They just had somebody illustrate everything. But when they're being chased through the... Uh, with the cave monster... Yep. And then instead of resolving that in any meaningful way, they just go, and then the cartoonist had a heart attack and died. So they were able to escape the monster, and the monster just vanishes. Um, so and that's good. just, it is, it's, all of it is extremely creative writing. The people behind Monty Python are incredible. Um, it's, it's really stunning to watch, and it's amazing that it still holds up in today. Most of it still holds up in today's, like, oversaturated, overexposed, overprocessed audio humor that oh, yeah. we get every day. It's amazing that a movie like this can still make people laugh. Yeah. And I think it's it's really like, you know, not to not to take it to any kind of level that I I, mean, I guess I'm insinuating with this, but like none of it's offensive. Like none of it's like it's it just proves that like you can still make humor that doesn't, you know, I don't want to say target, but like include certain people or ways of life or whatever That's in its jokes. Older. It's just it's just, yeah, I mean, it doesn't even have to be vulgar. I mean, you know, we all, we all love, you know, Jim Gaffigan, or at least we did back in the day. He's a, he's a clean guy. And then, but we also love, like, comedians that are a lot more, you know, vulgar. Like, you, you're, like what I'm trying to get at is, like, it doesn't always have to be that super vulgar thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, super bad. It doesn't have to be something that's just dirty oh, for the sake of being dirty. It's just legitimately funny because of the way it's written. Well, and I think now more than ever, that's when we talked in our state of comedy, I think that may hit that on the head too, is that it all feels overly focused now. And when the jokes that these comedians are writing for film necessarily, I still think there's great stand-ups out there. I just went yeah. saw Mike Wrigley recently. Very clean comedian. Hilarious. Fantastic act. Um, or routine. But I think when it comes to films all the new comedies seem so targeted. They're either against someone or something. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how we can poke fun at that or this concept. How can we make fun of, of this concept? Whereas I feel like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, at the end of the day, it's, it's a movie against movies. Yeah. And it knows that. So it's, it's showing you that, yes, we're a film, and we also realize how dumb it is that we were able to make this film. Yeah. Like, who, like who let us do this? And, and there's people, <laughs> there's people that could say like, oh, it's like, it's like a, it's joking about King Arthur. But even then, it's not. It's just using that as a setting for this low budget, like on purpose, <laughs> like comedy it's movie. Literally like, uh, it's like a J C Penny King Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> or a T J Max, or like yeah, like something like that. Big lots. Yeah, it's literally, but it, it it's literally just the backdrop, like you said. It's just the setting for the story. It does not really take anything from that, and there is no resolution for it. Like it's just, it just yeah. ends. Yeah, <laughs> there's. Literally... But I think that's what makes it so funny is that it's a satire. What it's poking fun at, what it's focused on, is itself. Yeah, it's not worried about correcting anybody's opinions or changing anyone's opinions. It's saying. Yeah. You're watching this thing, and we also know it's dumb. Like, that's the whole point. It's absurdist comedy. It's like, yeah. let's be as ridiculous as we possibly can, because that's what we want to do. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really needed more, uh, and it's missed for sure.
Definitely. And I and like I think like we said in our state of comedy episode, movies like this and um i mean it does have some insensitive jokes in it but like the the movie airplane like which i just rewatched recently it is one of my favorite comedy movies i actually shot up in like ranking it is just so perfectly written like we need to have a comeback with films like that like where the writing is good like the 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 jokes about the way we talk you know like surely you can't be serious i, I am and don't call me shirley is yeah it's all about where the comma goes yeah, like, you know, like, oh, we got to take him to a hospital. Hospital, what's that? It's a building with people in it, but that doesn't matter right now. <laughs> like, like, stuff like that is so good. We need to go back to stuff like that. I mean, I'm, I'm glad we get, you know, some comedy movies. Like, I recently, uh, I don't know if you've seen Booksmart. Uh, I have not. Booksmart's a very funny movie. It's in, it's, it is a female super bad, I guess, for for better or for worse. I, I, I actually think that Booksmart's better than super bad, in my opinion. But, like, it, it does take political stances I'm just because grow, of... Though. It had a lot of time. Yeah, it, it's, it's 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 it takes political stances and it and it makes jokes regarding that. Like, you you could just make movies about that are just that are just funny. Hopefully, I, I don't know. Like, just and that's actually my big problem with a lot of. I actually skip the SNL cold opens because they are a hundred percent political mm-hmm. every single time. And I like the skits that are not about anything. I like the skits that are just about the supermarket worker. Like at Target, getting ringing up the wrong item and getting in trouble for it. Like, we don't need to take crazy stances, and we don't need to poke fun at the at such controversial things all the time. That's not to me. That's not where core comedy lies. Exactly, it lies in the absurdity, expectation versus what you get. You know, like I think we play we play video games almost nightly and have for years. And I don't. Th- I bet political comedy makes up maybe a fraction of a percent of the stuff that absolutely ills us when we're all hanging out. Like if, you know, if anything, I, it's more like celebrity stuff or like know, stuff that's like that no one cares. Like not that no one cares about celebrities, but stuff that like isn't controversial. Yeah, just stuff that's going on. Exactly. But, yeah, this movie's missed for sure, and it, it was a welcome rewatch, a hundred percent. One hundred percent. Well, that's a spoiler too. Um, it's totally worth rewatching. Absolutely, still to this day, fantastic. But let's go ahead, give some final thoughts and some scores uh, before we end this episode. Um, you know, I'll go first. I, I feel okay. like I, I feel like I always uh, ask you to go first. So what I think about this movie? Okay. This... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I. My thoughts have already been made apparent over the course of this movie. Uh, my, Monty Python have indeed found the holy grail of comedy in this incredibly written, hilariously acted, and absolutely absurd take on the Arthurian legend. Because of that, shocker, I gave the movie 100. Whoa! It's it's nostalgic. It's not, it's not just, to me. It's not also nostalgic. It's also just perfect, and it's just that funny to me still. Which which yeah. Says something that I've seen, like, I've probably seen this movie about a hundred times, and it's still rip roariously funny to me a hundred times later. Which really says something. Yeah, no, absolutely it says something. Uh, I guess my last thought, I mean, I kind of already said it, but I think a movie like this is missed. It is needed in today's comedy world, because comedy is going away in film, I feel. Um, It's just not sustainable, and it doesn't make money like Endgame does, so no one wants to make them, but... They're needed, for sure, especially in certain times where people just need a good laugh and not to make fun of anything in particular, but just to be able to have a good time. Uh, This movie does have a couple things that I found a little dull on the rewatch, and those do take a bit away, but nowhere near enough to make this a bad film. Like, if you've seen it already, give it a rewatch. It is 100% worth it. Um, There's just a couple things as, as a whole of this movie that I feel like the more you see it, and again, Garrett literally just contradicted this, but the more that I see this movie, the more I feel like things may become more routine for me. Like, I expect them, and like we talked about, comedy is about expectations and and evading them mm-hmm. and going above and beyond them. So the more I watch it, the more that tends to happen. So I gave this movie a 95. All righty. I, th- I think it might be something to, to be said in uh, the idea that, like, there's a lot of people I know that watch like TV shows over and over and over again because it's like a comfort place. Right. I think this is one of those for, for, at least for me, like it's, I can always, always come back to it and the same things are always funny. It's like certain people at the office, 
right? They, they, they watch it to fall asleep. They watch it because they know it's consistent, whatever it may be. So maybe, maybe it's just along those lines. If you have not seen this movie before, first off, shame on you. Second, like if you're getting into a little bit more into film and you want to start looking into things more critically and like you want to, you know, learn like what good film is, watch this. Like it, it's absolutely, I, I would say it's necessary viewing when it comes to the comedy genre. Yeah, I completely agree. So, but uh, that's going to bring us to an end of this episode. Adrian, if anyone doesn't know where to find us, which in the 90 plus episodes we've done so far, if they haven't got this through their skulls yet, where can they find us online? The Drive Back Podcast here on YouTube. If you're watching us, uh, go ahead and subscribe. Hit the bell button. We post every Monday. Uh, any podcasting app as well. We are the Drive Back Podcast. Make sure to follow us again every Monday. Uh, and make sure if you like the podcast or maybe we make you laugh a little bit or maybe we make you go watch something, please go ahead and give us any review. Those five-star ones really kick us up a notch. Uh, and if you get a five-star, I believe we've shouted out the five stars that we get. Yeah. So you might get a shout out on the podcast, a, a little billboard if you if you want to call it that. And if you've left us a five star review and we haven't called you out, it's probably because we haven't checked in a while. <laughs> That's not my realms. <laughs> <laughs> I will check for you. A little bit of a chop shop back here. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're falling behind. Hey, uh, if any ten of you, do you guys know who I'm talking about? Because you're here. Mm-hmm. If you guys leave a five star review. We'll shout you out. We will go back through next episode. Let's make a point. We will look. If there are any five stars, you will get a shout out. Absolutely. Uh, and and we'll we, do that Because we shouted out Steve. We shouted out Zach. We also got to shout out our other consistent listener as well. Kevin. Kevin, Hannah, you're on. If you're listening to this, thank you, bud. Always here's a, here's a real trick ready for my girlfriend, Cassidy. If you're watching this, here's your shout out. And all you have to do is let me know that you heard it. And I will know that you listened to this episode. <laughs> oh, alrighty, test for the call. relationship. <laughs> yeah, the next episode. So I'm single. <laughs> it didn't, it didn't it's just a cardboard box behind you. I've been kicked out. Uh, it's going well. So uh, my pool setup. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> on the street. <laughs> Uh, but next week we got a franchise fever, uh, one that's not really much of a big franchise, but it is a trilogy of films that are all sort of connected, so we're counting it as a franchise. Uh, we're going to take a look at the Cornetto trilogy, which includes Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and The World's End, uh, which, looking forward to those. No spoilers. Awesome. Yeah. I have not seen The World's End still, so oh. it is a first time oh. viewing for this guy. Um, but we got a lot of awesome episodes coming up, including our 100th episode spectacular, which we still need to figure out what we're doing, but, uh, we've still got some time. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week here on the drive back. Thank you for listening to this episode of the drive back. Make sure to be on the lookout for new episodes every Monday and make sure to follow us on social media.